the thing that happens, I have my, I have my, my, my little thing when these things happen off screen. When they happen off screen. Your thing happened off screen. Now, you probably can't tell me, but would your character return, sir? <laughs> I have no idea. God damn it. God, I knew you were actors. I knew what you were going to say, but I, I'm trying to be a journalist. For, for, for God damn it. Welcome back, people, to the Table Read podcast. Hope everyone's well, happy, and smiling. Now, um, if you are a regular guest of the podcast, you know that when I come over to the desk that I'm going on a virtual flight. Last time I went to Paris, today I'm going to our good friends across the pond to the States as our guest is a Los Angeles native. You, if you don't know him, I don't know how you don't know him because listen, his work spans from everything. We're gonna get to it. Cause this, this man, I swear, is a force to be reckoned with, man. Um, yeah, people, g- grab some popcorn, grab a snack, sit down, relax, cause it's, it's a good one. We have Mr. Tommy L. Jenkins in the building. How are you, sir? I am so good, Taj. I'm so, so, so good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you coming down, man. And in, I know the weather's not the best in LA right now. It's it's not sunny, sunny like we all. That most people sort of equate with Hollywood and California <laughs> and the surfing and the beach life. We are drenched in rain um, and floods at the moment. So it's a little, it's a little bit of rough to navigate all that at the moment. But the flip side of that is it's wonderful for nature because normally we're so dry and brown everywhere. But when this is all lifted, it's going to be so green and so beautiful across the the hills and the mountains, which we don't get a chance to see that very often. So that's a very good way to see it. Honestly, that's a, that's very true. But yeah, man, and regardless, I appreciate you for for coming on. Um, we met very recently um, for the first time at, um, end of November um, for. I can say, can I see? They, you and they've announced you. We, Tommy's going to be in Devon Paradise, ladies and gentlemen. You will see him. You, you will see him very soon. In Devon Paradise. Paradise he make it you know what I mean? It is coming. They would have announced it by now if they haven't. Oh well, listen. We make our own rules here, man. It's all good. Um, yeah, his episode is amazing. The cast is amazing. He does an amazing job. You guys will see it. You, you, you guys will see why. If you didn't know him before, then you really should have. I don't know what's the matter with you lot. Um, but yeah, that's that's just a recent credit that you have and recent bit of work you've done your career has, has spanned from listen man i've got my notes here this is the one time i've actually made notes for a Bro, podcast what? because i was like if i don't i'm gonna lose track honestly it's, it's gonna be all over oh, the place like, i gotta keep a sense of direction here so yes um i spoke to you briefly when we met over in guadalupe um obviously i know you you live in la you lived in london for a point in time for a reason we're gonna get to in a second um but first i want to go before that, I want I want to go before time. <laughs> before time, but before the lovely times of us getting work and all that good stuff, I want, I want to go. Um, how how did this all start? How how did you how did you get here? How did you start doing what you're doing, man? How did it all begin? Wow, sit back, kids. Um, it's a uh... <laughs> grandpa's got a story for you. <laughs> and listen, I uh, I started relatively young, I would suppose, when I was 14. I know people start at a much earlier age than that, but I grew up in in the Midwest, in Ohio. And basically, the long story short is I started my first musical stage show uh, at 14, and it was basically through a summer program that was, uh, grants were given given to a, a particular arts program called the Urban Arts. And I started that and doing the show at 14, and that was sort of getting, uh, I got bit by the bug, you know, of being able to sort of perform and be in a in a in a musical and that sort of stuff. And that's kind of where it began and be and from that led into joining the 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 ballet company that was there and the and the local theater company and sort of learning the trade of dance and and the discipline of the art form of ballet and all that sort of stuff. And and basically I suppose I was just a kid with a dream and wanting and having these aspirations to do stuff in the entertainment field, but living in a small town in Ohio, you you just kind of take little baby steps and try to figure out where to go. And then I think it was probably getting uh, the opportunity to go to New York with the ballet company and take classes and things like that and getting used to 
being around Broadway and and uh, the sort of fame era, you know, with uh, the, the kids from fame and the high school performing arts. And that was, that was my time growing up in that, that sort of joy. Um, and so that inspired me. And then it was, it became sort of, I got to move to New York. So you do all of that and then you get, you start to, to build this momentum. Um, and for me, it's just always been, I don't feel like it's ever been a, uh, a really fast track for me. I just feel like I've just been a really slow and steady race uh, in terms of my career. Things have just kind of happened and some good things, some not so good things, And but you learn from everything, you know? Um, so that's how it, it, it kind of all began. And I just, over time, you know, some great projects have just happened to come along and meeting great people and, you know, whether that be in the theater or the dance world or, you know, the voice, overworld or whatever mm. television and stuff so it's just been it's been a wide range of stuff you know brilliant so w would you say it, it was because i think I'm, I'm i feel like i'm very similar i was i started off in musical theater and obviously musical theater singing dancing and acting which i liked at the beginning um but as time went on i kind of fell into more of the acting side of things and that's kind of what i fell in love with is that similar to you or, or you still even now wanted to jump back on the stage yeah, it, it is. I mean, I, I will always, I will always have a passion for dance, even though I don't dance anymore. Like I'll go, if I happen to be in New York, I'll go see New York City Ballet or American Ballet Theater or Dance Theater of Harlem or Alvin, Alvin Ailey. Um, I still have that passion to watch it because I look at the, the things that I was taught. You know, you look for the technique. So now you look at dance in a different, in a different way and you can appreciate it. Um, but I do still have that passion to be on stage, although I haven't been on stage probably since 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, Jersey Boys I think, was the last stage show that I did um, both in London, I did London, New York and Las Vegas. Um, but I I think what happens is that over time you, you start to realize that, oh, maybe I need to make a transition, you know, because you can only dance for so long, <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. um, <laughs> you know, and then singing becomes one of those things where I still love to sing, but in my, in my way, and there comes a point where you're, you're singing the scores of musicals and some things are maybe in your range, some things are maybe not in your range. And so you have to, the work for those particular things and roles are gonna be very different because, you know, I, if, you're a, if you're a baritone and the role requires you to be a tenor, you know, well, I'm not going to do that. So that's not going to work or vice versa. I, I, don't even, I don't even know what that means, honestly. I don't even know what either of those words mean. I just know singing high note, low note. I can't hit the high note, so I hit the low note. That's all I know. <laughs> well, you're good. You're good. Thank you. Thank you. I try. But it is one of those things where you just kind of, you start to make decisions and transitions in your life and your career and figure out, where do I want to go? And acting has always been the kind of thing that was simmering underneath because it's a required element for pretty much everything, you know, whether you're acting through dance or acting through song or acting through the dialogue, it's, it's always there. So now it, for me, it's been a lot about focusing on, I suppose, the dialogue of, of acting and the emotions of things and whether that's on camera or behind a mic in a studio doing voiceover work or whatever, you know? So um, they've all been pretty challenging, but I think that's, uh, I think that's where I kind of made that shift where, like I said, I don't, I haven't given up the stage. I'd love to go back and do a play perhaps on mm -hmm. Broadway. Musicals are a little different though, because you know, waking up to do a, a matinee for a musical and trying to get that voice all ringing up there at the top. <laughs> think, oh man, this is hard. Eight shows a week is hard work, man. People don't realize it. So like I said, I have my notes, Tommy. You mentioned you were in Jersey Boys. I know actors hate to do this by listing their credits, but on this platform, we give people their flowers. I'm not gonna do that right now. So listen, Take notes, ladies and gentlemen. We have Cats, a chorus line, Five Guys Named Mo, Oh What A Night, Fame, Pearly, Aladdin, as the genie, by the way. Not everyone can play the genie. If you play the genie, you're a bad man. Uh, tick, Tick, Boom, Whistle Down the Wind, Dirty Dancing, Jersey Boys, and Cinderella. Now, listen, just reading them credits alone, it sounds like a lot of work. But from someone that knows the musical theatre process, I know that one of those shows alone is a lot of work. And the fact that you've done how many i don't even want to count how many is there that's a lot of work tommy that's that's a lot of work that's a lot of work and you was in london at the time doing all these shows wasn't you yeah yeah london is you know london was uh 
I moved away from New York and I went to Germany and I did uh, uh, Cats in Germany. It was the first uh, show that I'd done outside. And then I, from there, I started doing a little bit of recording uh, for our uh, Polydor records and stuff. And then I moved to London. Uh, and Five Guys Named Mo was my very first show in, in mm. London. And it became a sort of stable for me. I absolutely mm. adore London. I love it. I <laughs> I do. And to me, it, it is like my second home. I've lived there half my life. Um, and fortunately for me, I've had some wonderful times there with work uh, and everything. And so I feel like it has played a great deal. London has paid, played a major deal in where my career is, you know, uh, in terms of work and, and, and working with so many wonderful people in, in the, in the West end, um, and in getting a chance to do a bit of television stuff over there as well. So, mm -hmm. um, it is, it's definitely, uh, a place that I love coming back to. Brilliant. When out of all of your shows you did in London, what would you say was the most challenging? Like when I look at back, back at my musical theater shows, the, my, without even thinking about it, Matilda was the hardest show I've ever done. It was a love, it was really, really fun. Um, but it was just, it was really demanding. There's a lot of singing, a lot of dancing. And to someone like me who wasn't as trained as the other kids, it was really hard. And that's, that's the only thing I can remember from Matilda was, it was fun, but it was hard. So out of everything you did in, 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 in West End, what would, when it comes to your mind, what would you say was, was the hardest show you've done? The one that took like the most effort? Um, I would say uh, Five Guys Named Mo. Okay. I think about it. when I'm when I'm when I think right right at this moment, because uh, when when I heard you, re you know, sort of list the the credits, sometimes you forget what you've done. <laughs> Time has gone on. You think, oh yes, of course I did that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is. Um, I would say five guys named Mo was that is was incredibly challenging because. There's only five of you. There's actually six in the in the cast, but there is five Mo's, and you all sing, you all dance, and you all break a sweat, and you're in it together, and it is a nonstop marathon. I remember. I don't think it's probably one of the shows that I, I don't think I can recall sweating as much <laughs> as I do in Five Guys Mo. If you've ever seen the show, I think there's a video of of our company that was released. Um, and we would all have these, as part of the costumes, you had these flannels that you would keep in your pocket, that they, they were they were flannels that matched the color coordination of whatever suit uh, you were wearing. So we were flashy, man, you know, we were <laughs> really fabulous. But you pull the flannel, because you sweat so much, you always had a flannel and you're constantly dabbing yourself throughout the show, you know? Um, but that was, mm. it was so much fun, but it was hard work. It was hard mm. work. And I, that's what I was thinking. I'm looking at all, of all your credits and I only know, obviously, doing musical theater as a kid. So we don't do every single night. We do, we have teams of, we have three different teams. You alternate here and there, exactly rehearsals. It won't be, it'll be every single day, but you're not going to be rehearsing nonstop. You might take a break to let another team go and rehearse. So when I, I've never done any um, stage performances as, as an adult. So when I think about musical theater, doing all of those shows as an adult, I'm like hell no. That's really that's long as <laughs> that's really really long. That's just a lot of work. And obviously the adults will do the most of the dancing and singing. In the shows that I was on, the kids would do a bit of singing here and there, but the adult cast would be the ones that took like the main bit of the movement. So to be doing that every single day, good on you, my friend. Good on you. <laughs> I respect it. It's not for everybody. Fame was hard too. I have to say when I when I did that. Uh, mm playing Tyrone in fame, you know, jumping around and doing, you know, just crazy, crazy stuff uh, dance wise. That that was hard too. But yeah, Five Guys, I think it was just one of those ones where it was a, a different energy because you're singing your guts out all the time and dancing and, you know, Charles Augens, who choreographed and directed it was, you know, a taskmaster, you know, when he would put that show, he's like, no, no, he would have you working nonstop, man, nonstop. <laughs> So you, you lived in London, for, like you said, half your life. Um, so you, you know London like the back of your hand like any other Londoner, pretty much. Um, but I don't know Los Angeles at all. I've only been to New York in America for a brief amount of time. Um, so how would you compare London to LA? Because to me, they're very different, but I've heard they do have a few similarities here and there. Oh my God. I, I, I think they're like chalk and cheese, man. I think they're so mm. different. 
so, so, so different. I would say uh, London is probably closer to New York than it is to. That's why I said, that's why I said, yeah. Definitely. And that simply has a lot to do more, I think, with the, the vibe. London has this amazing, amazing vibe like New York does. New York is a beast on its own. You know, um, but, London, but London is like the the European equivalent, <laughs> a little bit. It's a uh, it's it's fast paced. It's it's um, you know, there's that whole sort of cultural side of it. There's a whole fashion side of it. I love London fashion. It's one of the things that I miss uh, being in LA because LA is you know, it's t-shirts and shorts and beach weather and you know. But London was a place where you could uh, like New York. You go through the seasons and you had this array of fashion and it didn't matter mm. you dressed and it was like in the winter you have these layers you know in the summer you still had a fashion thing you know whether it's a a button up a little dicky bow and a short <laughs> shirt, you know, and skinny jeans and you know I, I don't know it's just it was the whole european vibe about um about that but i think they're incredibly different uh cities uh la is very spread out it is very open it is surrounded by mountains um concrete mm -hmm. is the freeways everywhere with traffic you know mm -hmm. and during rush hours 12 lanes of traffic you know six on either side it's it's and they come to a standstill i've heard about i've heard about la and yeah it doesn't sound it doesn't sound pleasant at all you have to really see it and be in it at once to experience and kind of go yeah it's not it's not for me but i you mm -hmm. know what i love being in my car i love you know, pre-pandemic, it was one of those things about going to castings and auditions and stuff or whatever, where I I enjoyed mm. getting in my car and mm. driving myself to my casting, whether that was going to, you know, the Universal Studio or Paramount or whatever casting house was, was doing whatever they were doing. And you have that moment to yourself in the car and you just leave early enough. You know, you know you've got to battle um, mm depends on what time of the day your audition is, whether you have to deal with traffic or not. And, you know, sometimes it was just nice being in the car and having your music on or whatever it was, you're in your own world versus having to get on public transport and deal with the people and the hustle and bustle and getting there. And, you know, so I do like that. And you drive everywhere in LA, you know, there is yeah. public transport, but it's not the same as London and New York, mm. you know, um, you can't, I can't get anywhere in 15 minutes. Oh, that sounds awful. <laughs> it does, but at the same time, you kind of, I think you get used to it and you prepare yourself. You think, well, if I got to, when I say I need to get over the hill um, into Hollywood, because I live in in, um, in the Valley, which is sort of Studio City, Sherman Oaks, um, mm. very close, still easy to get to everywhere. Um, mm. But you do have to plan timing-wise, driving where, where you need to go and how much time you're going to need, depending on, what time of the day it is but yeah the two two places are very different i think what we share is uh the industry uh in terms of the television and film being done here as well as it is in london you know yeah. so i think we share those aspects of, of it but to me i think that's probably as close in, in my opinion that, mm. that I can think of that sort of that I that I can relate to. I don't really see that there's anything other than that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they're just completely different cities. London's like fast and LA mm. is fast too, but in a different way. Do you know what I mean? I just yeah. feel like it's this mm. calming laid back side of it. What going, you mentioned our industries are very similar. Um, one thing I, I love honestly about being a, a young black actor in London is that you go to one audition and you're probably going to see about 17 different people that you know probably going for the exact same role as you is that the same in in la as well um it it can be you know i and partly is, is that when i moved here i really didn't know anybody so me going to auditions and and, and running into somebody that i knew was very slim mm -hmm. um but in in london that was always the case that was yeah. always I go to an audition and it became like a little reunion. And sometimes you would end up going out for a coffee with people after the audition, you hang out. Yeah. Well, I'm in town. I might as well stick around for a little bit and go and catch up with some friends or whatever, which is, which is wonderful. And that doesn't really happen in LA. Mm. 
You know, mm. you kind of get in, you do your audition and you get out. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it. Very rarely, I think, if people who've been here, if it was to happen now, I might bump into someone that I know um, if you're up for the same role. But usually, and as a Black actor, you know, sometimes now because of where casting is going, um, there's a much more eclectic or diverse group of people being seen for, for roles. And so that, that little pool can be a much more mixed group rather than yeah. being, you know, you know, you're going for a role that they're casting specifically black and you're going to run into people that you, you know, in terms of black actors and things like that. But um, I think the, I think it's, I think that's just very different. And also now in this day and age, everything is di digital. You know, I'm literally sitting up in my, in my, in my loft here where I do most of my auditions. Don't get me started on self tapes, man. I swear. It's a self tape. Oh, no, I know, no, man. Literally. You know, everything on my wall here is completely blue. I've got all my cameras and my lights over there. So I'm. This is pretty much whether I am doing a Zoom or a audition or a self tape to, to yeah. be sent in. This is pretty much where the office is now. Well, speaking of self tapes and auditions, again, we're going back to giving you your flowers, sir. Just to name a few, just to name a few. We'll be here all day, honestly, if I go through all your credits, bro. You've been so much. I wish I could mention them all, but we got to stick to a time limit here, man. Just to name a few when it comes to TV and film. Uh, the Callback Queen, The Trip, Papi Chulo, Dolomite Is My Name, Law and Order, Unsolved, The Murders of Biggie and Tupac, Pandora, Star Trek. And another most recent one that we're going to get to. We're going to get to, I think you know the one I'm going to focus on. I think you know. But before we get to that, um, tell me about the filming in 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 America because I've I've only known obviously filming on a, a British UK production, and I don't know. To me, there's a bit there's, there's a fast paced element to working in the UK, but it also is quite like a laid back feeling. Like you're usually shooting on location somewhere and in a field and flipping Cornwall or something, whatever. But in my mind, without actually having experienced it, to me LA is is quick, 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 quick. We're filming in the studio. We're on time limits. Is, is it very fast paced or, or am I wrong? Is it quite chill as well? You know, I, I comparing to stuff that I've done in the UK and, and LA, I think I don't, when it comes to that kind of work environment, I feel like it's, it's kind of the same. I feel like they, okay. everything's on a time limit. You know, we've got, you know, the shooting order, the, you know, you get your day out of days and you look at your sheet and you see what's going to be done for that day. What's on the schedule. You go in and you get in the, get in the makeup, you get set, you have a rehearsal, you shoot, you move on. We got it. Let's go on, on to the next location or we're going yeah. to the next scene and move on. And, um, I think it all, it all works the same. I think it all works the same. You might have different aspects and directors who might work a little differently or a little slower paced or look, take a little more time. And you have those who just kind of want to just, yeah. let's just get through it because with time is yeah. money and we need, we need to crack off. Facts. You know? so, Facts. But for the most part, I, I think it's, uh, it feels the same to me. Whenever I get on a set, it feels like the set is, it's new because of that particular production, but and 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 the crew that I'm working with. But the element of what we do and how we work is always the same. Mm. You know, our work ethic seems to always, you know, is always the same in terms, and certainly for me, um, and how how we process and get on. And some some sets you have more fun on than you do on others. Oh, I, yeah. I've come, to know. and that has a lot <laughs> to do with the environment, I think, as well. So, yeah. Now on to the, the very obvious thing I have to speak to you about. It is literally the show everybody is talking about right now. I've literally just finished it. I was on episode seven and as we, we I messaged you, we agreed you're going to come and I was like, I really need to finish it before. I, I don't know why I haven't finished it yet. And I watched the last episode and it's sick. It's, it's Wednesday, Wednesday, the show that everyone and their mother is watching right now, man, for obvious reasons. It's a ridiculous, ridiculous show. It's amazing. You play, uh, you play the mayor. I'm gonna talk about your story. I have my theories. You probably can't talk about it too much, but I'm, uh, I'm gonna get to it. But May Mayor Walker, Mayor, tell me about Mayor Walker, man. What was that process like from, um, you know, um, before you auditioned for the role or however that happened to getting on set for the first time? Listen, I um, I I literally was up here in, in my little studio. I got the self tape through as we do from our our. Uh, team of people and 
I thought, okay, well, it, it didn't really say for sure what it was, but when I, it, the title was a different title for, mm. for the show. Um, and although it was kind of under wraps about how much we could say, um, I did, I saw the, one of the scenes that I had to put on tape was a scene that actually had Morticia in it. And okay. I saw the top, the name and I was like, this has got to be something to do with the Adams family. How many yeah. Morticias do you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, so that was, I, I did the tape um, and it was, uh, the role for, for the mayor was slightly different to how it was um, presented on, on paper. And it was, I, my thing was, how can I bring my myself to this particular role? And then, you know, and I do get cast in a lot of um, sort of authoritarian roles. I mean, you're either gonna be a father or I do detectives and district attorneys and things like that, you know, sort of those type of roles or politicians, you know, or CEO mm -hmm. of a company. And they they sit certain those types of roles kind of sit with me a, a little bit. I think we all mm. have that, that within us that we yeah. have certain niches that we fit into. Um, but I did this, and I sent the audition, and I was very, uh, you know, send it in, let it go. Who knows? On to the next. That's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I was walking through the park. Uh, I go for a three mile walk in the park uh, when the weather's great, uh, and I got a call from my agent saying, listen, just so you know, uh, I wanted to let you know that you've been handpicked by Tim Burton to play the mayor. And then I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I literally <laughs> the entire park down just out of pure excitement for, for the chance of being able to work with Tim Burton yeah. uh, for start and then to actually get this role in it. Um, and it was his first step into television. You know, he does a lot of film but it was gonna be his first TV uh, directorial debut. But, you know, he also helped create it in terms of designing and all that stuff. He had his his hands in so many uh, bits of the pie, I think, with, with this particular project. But it was a great experience. It was filmed in Romania. Um, and so that, that was challenging in itself. But for the most part, I met some wonderful people uh, who I am still in contact with today um, and had the opportunity to work with some great people, you know, like Gwendolyn Christie and Catherine Zeta-Jones, Jenna, um, Jamie McShane, who plays the sheriff, um, all and Ricky Lindholm, Hunter, all of them. I, I love them because we've all maintained uh, a good relationship outside of that now that the project is, is out and airing. But if you would have told me how successful it was going to be, I did. I did not see that. I, mm. I would imagine it was going to be good because it was Tim Burton and and mm. the writers Al, Al Goff and and Miles Miller, um, who wrote it. I knew you had a great team of people, but I don't know if anyone could have foreseen that it was going to be the phenomenon that it turned out to be. You know, um, but yeah, it was great. I, I I absolutely enjoyed it. Absolutely enjoyed it. Right. Now, sir, I have my theories, right? I have my theory. If, if I, I won't say exactly what happened for the people that haven't watched it for whatever reason. Um, but so, something happens to your character, right? The thing that happens, I have, my, I have my, my, my little thing when these things happen off screen. When they happen off screen. Your thing happened off screen. Now, you probably can't tell me, but... Would your character return, sir? I have no idea. God damn it. God, I knew you were actors. I knew what you were going to say, but I, I was trying to be a journalist. For, for, for God damn it. You know, would I like, would I like for him to return? Of course I would. I think, it, yeah, I think there is room for him. And obviously my, I have a son um, and everything. And uh, yeah, yeah, it would be, be wonderful. But if, if he doesn't, I also understand why mm. uh, that that can also be. Um, but, you know, I always say to people, because you're not the only person who's asked me that uh, and you're not the only person who has kind of gone, God, I, I, I need you to come back. I need to find out what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, because I think there, there could be some unresolved issues. I think there was more to him that people didn't get a chance to see and really yeah. understand why he was 
doing the things he was doing. Um, and I think part of that was a lot for his family. And although people might think differently of him because of the stuff that he was doing, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there would be room to sort of explore that and kind of get dig deeper into him just to kind of figure out so people really understood uh, a little bit more about him. Um, but, you know, if, if that was to happen, that would be great. If it doesn't, you know, I, it's been a wonderful journey just to be a part of this this phenomenon that, has, that mm -hmm. has happened. Um, you know, and I think he, you know, we say that I play, a, I'm a small wheel in this, in the big machine, but it's a very integral part to very the story, you know? Um, so it has been a great uh, privilege and an honor to be a part of it. Uh, and it's just, it's, it certainly has enhanced a lot of uh, things in my mind to think about for future and and how things work but like i said it was just one of those things that came along it was une unexpected i was overjoyed to to get it um and everything and then to have the journey that we've had with it has been been pretty amazing it's an amazing show man it's, it's number one in the world for a reason you don't get numbers like that just just because it's on tv you have to be it has to be good from everything from the writing directing costume design music the script the actors everything is flawless it's, it's it's ridiculous it's amazing so just congratulations for even being a part of that and like you said playing such an integral character it, it's, it's, it's it's amazing and, and that's how i looked at that's how i looked at it you know um sometimes i think we as actors people kind of go oh you know i didn't do very much in it and you know but at the same time i think my my biggest thing is is having gratitude for work that I do simply because we work in an industry where uh, work is work can be very far and few between mm -hmm. for what mm -hmm. we do and we get you know a good break to be a series regular on a good running show or whatever you know but in the interim for me I always try to be grateful for everything that comes along and to be to have what I have with this particular show in incredibly grateful because it has you know, it has elevated a lot of of things just simply by the fact that how popular the the show is. You know, we are talking around the world. It's it's crazy. It's crazy. So, I, yeah, I'm very proud to be a part of it. Brilliant. Well, I'm looking forward to season two, and I, I hope I do see you in series because there, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Like you said, I'm not satisfied just yet. I'm not <laughs> satisfied just yet. Um, I love when people are unsatisfied. <laughs> that's the best way. Keep them, keep them guessing. Keep them reaching. But again, um, back to giving you your flowers, sir. Um, sorry, it's not going to stop. But this is what we're this is what we're doing. You have done something right that honestly I'm I'm so jealous of because it's it's I feel like I'll be able to do it one day, but it, there's, the opportunity hasn't come up yet. You've been in video games, which is I don't even play games like that. But just the, the no, just the fact to be in one is ridiculous. Is is mad to me. Um, to name a few. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ, this guy is mad. If you're not listening, please, people, take it in. Gee, let me stop. Let me relax. Um, Guild Wars 2. Oh, listen, I'm messing up my setup, getting too excited. <laughs> Guild Wars 2. Pillars of Eternity 2. Fallout um, 76. Fallout 76. Wastelanders. My videographer, by the way, is a massive Fallout fan. So uh, you might have to say hello to him in a second once, once we're done. <laughs> um, Death Stranding, Bayonetta 3, and Gotham Knights. Now... That, uh, where do I even start, man? How do you even do that? How do you even... How do you beat in a video game? What is that process? I feel like I know, but at the same time, I, I don't at the same time. Well, the, I, I suppose there's two different sides to it. There's there's the video game aspect where you do... You go into a booth and you record the dialogue like you would any script, but it's like mm. instead of instead of you having to be on the set and doing all that sort of stuff, you, you're you in there just reading the lines and looking at uh, the overall, I suppose, arc of the show and, and whatever your character is, um, whether that's a, a multiple characters or whether you're a lead character or a supporting character. Um, it just kind of really depends. That's just purely the voice aspect of it if you're doing motion capture video games where you're not only just doing the voice but you're also doing the the 
the movement of it and the action of that particular character where they do, you know, you put the suits on, you've got the dots all over you and all that. It's sort of so thing. cool, man. It's so cool. It seems like so much fun. <laughs> it's really cool. But you know what? I find that it is, um, people have asked the questions in the past about what are the differences between the two mediums in terms of TV, doing TV and film and something like motion capture. Mm -hmm. And I think, I would say TV and film is great because, you know, we have the luxury, as you know, you're on a, on a, on a great series with Death in Paradise where you go to work, you have everything around you. You've got your set, you've got your costume, you've got your props, you've got the elements that you deal with, you've got everything around you physically that you would have in a real life yeah. situation. Yeah. Whereas in motion capture, we have to be on a sound stage where we have bits of things that are representative of those things. Do you know what I mean? Or where we have to dig a little deeper as actors uh, to create certain emotions because we don't have anything around us except a green screen or a, or a, a, a blank wall or, or, or wood stick that represents a gun. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's things like that. And so if you're in a snowstorm or you're in the rain, you have to find a way to act and deliver your dialogue as if you're in those elements versus actually, you know, in TV and film, we were able to create those elements for you. Um, you know, so I do find that really hard. But as far as getting into them, I think it's just, once again, you know, I have a, a, a voiceover agency who uh, submits me to things and some things I get, some things I don't. It's just like a regular audition process. You go, I go in my recording studio, I do the material, send it through to my agents and either I'll hear, hear back or not. Um, but I've got a, a, a few things pending at the moment that I'm waiting and some that I've already been a bail check for that's coming up, which is great. Um, nice. but I, <laughs> so that's always wonderful. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a different side of, of, of acting and working and because there is no, um, like I said, uh, the motion capture and the video game side of just doing the voiceovers, completely different sides, but they do eventually come together. But it's a, it's a fun, uh, a really fun thing to do. You know, some of the characters I've been able to do have been great. And some, you know, breaking barriers, I suppose, in, in some respects like Gotham Knights, which I, which was the last, uh, one that's come out, been released, the whole uh, Batman kind of being a part of that family, but playing a character, you know, an iconic character known in that in that world. Um, and as a black man voicing this particular character as well, you know. Um, so those things and, and things like working with Kojima on Death Stranding, which is, you know, a whole nother phenomenon uh, as well. So yeah, it's been great. It's been really, really cool. I see you have some memorabilia in the background there. I, I do see it. Let's yes, please bring bring them over. What what's 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 that from? This is this is Die Hardman from Death yeah. Stranding. Death Stranding. Yeah. So that was uh, Hideo Kojima's production of that. Uh, this is all. These, these are all pretty much from uh, Death Stranding. That's, okay. Uh, that's a little beat pod. And this fantastic thing was created for me um, as my That's character. Sick. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So I keep those little buddies up on the little shelf, and they uh, they kind of live there for the moment. But yeah, the little things, you know. Um, but that that, like I said, that was another uh, great uh, role uh, mm. to play. Simply because, once again, if for anyone who's like a who knows Kojima and are Metal Gear fans in terms of video games, because that's the other thing. Here's what's interesting: is that I'm a lot of voice actors are gamers as well. Yeah, I don't consider myself a gamer at all. I will play a game, and I've actually played Death Stranding because I thought, well, I need to try and play this. I'm in it. <laughs> and it's it's a, a complex story. It's really complex, but. Um, it is one of those things that you kind of try, I try to do, but I don't consider myself a gamer, you know, at, at all. I, I voice them and I do them. Uh, and I've, I've gotten to, to play more since I've been doing a lot more. Um, 
But, you know, the minute you get a console, the console, like I'm on a, a PS4 or something, now there's PS5, and now some of the, the games that I do aren't for PS4. <laughs> Honestly, I'm like, what's the deal? What's the deal? So rather than get frustrated, I go, well, don't get yourself locked in. Just go do the work. Do the work. <laughs> That's brilliant, man. Uh, like, like I said, you, you're a force. The, the fact that we started off talking about doing musical theatre in London to now talking about being in a game that you can only play on the PS5 is mad. Yeah. There's, the only, there's only a certain amount of people in this world you can talk to that the conversation will go from there to there in the space of like, what, 15 minutes. Um, but yeah, like, listen, man, I think we'll leave it there, man. I, I really appreciate you for coming on. I really want you to give your flowers, man, because there's, there's, like I said, you're a force. You're a beast. You're a beast. If people don't know who you are, they really should. They really should know who they should, they should know who you are. They should know your face. Um, anything you want to plug? Any any social media people to find you anywhere, man? I will say you you, you know you can find me on on Twitter. That's T J eighty four. That's T E E J A Y E eighty four. Or Tom Miro Jenkins official on Instagram. That's usually where I'm at. Uh, I do have a YouTube channel. I haven't posted on that for a while, but I do once in a while do some stuff on that. Um, but I want to say to you, uh, thank you for being a so gracious and wonderful and talented as you are uh when i got a chance to work with you on death in paradise and whether we're talking about it or not but i just want to let you know <laughs> I think you're absolutely wonderful uh and it was such a pleasure to work with all of you but it was an absolute pleasure uh, to get to work with you on that so thank you no i i appreciate you man i just want to I've, I've been acting for a long time and the one thing I want to do is just have fun when I'm acting. That's why I started it. And I want to just continue to have fun. And when we have people like you guys, you, uh, Jackie, all of you guys on set, it doesn't feel like you're working. It feels like you're on holiday with three of your mates. And every now and again, you jump on camera and say, say a few words, which is the best way it is. That's the best way it is. So thank, thank you. Thank you, vice versa, man. Um, but yeah, again, I appreciate you for coming on. I appreciate all of you guys for watching um as usual audio on spotify visuals on youtube for please check out tommy everything he's doing i beg of you please just you, you should just keep him just keep him keep don't let go of tommy please he's a force um thank you very much guys thank you to billy for helping out as usual and take care peace tommy 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 oh my goodness this is why i wanted you on my friend what an episode.